All right, friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Angel, and today we're gonna be doing a video I'm so excited about. We're kind of gonna do a little like crash course on Sarah J. Mass. I always want to do more books like this. Like I'm talking about like a series or an author, kind of like book reviews. I'm always nervous to make them because it's not like what I typically do on this channel. But I decided Sarah J. Mass is a great one to start with because I love her dearly. So also I kind of have like a little map for this video, but I also think I'm just gonna be rambling a lot in this because I love to yap and I love to yap about this woman and her books. So we're gonna chit chat and have fun. Start with, Sarah J. Mass is a romantic author. Okay, so first you need to know, her books are not just strictly fantasy. There's always some sprinkling of romance in her books and some are a lot heavier than others. She has three series out currently, two ongoing, one completed. First one is Akatar. If you've heard of Sarah J. Mass, you've heard of these, probably what you've heard of. This is like her big romantic series that is still ongoing currently. Then you have my Roman Empire, which is Throne of Glass. The series is complete. It's a massive eight book series. I currently am missing one because it's with my sister-in-law because she's reading it currently after I've heavily influenced her to do so. And then last one, I am missing the copy of the last book, but is the Crescent City series. This is like her thick urban fantasy. One thing I always love highlighting too, just because I think it's like insane, is that this is her first book she ever wrote, like publication order. This is where she started with Throne of Glass and she wrote this when she was 16. Like that goes for itself. Now the biggest question when it comes to Sarah J Mass is where do you start? The only place I would say to not start is this bad boy right here. Don't start with Crescent City of the three. And the reason is technically, I guess you could read this singular book first and then go into the other things if you're more into urban fantasy. The problem is by the second book, we start having what we call some mass verse happening where, you know, like the spider verse where everything crosses over, it happens in these books. Or if it's like just started to with the book she's recently released, some things start crossing over between series. So if you read this book, without reading the other series, it's not gonna hit the same. And you're like, what, why is everybody jaw dropping at this? You're not gonna get it. So the two places you can start are Akatar or Throne of Glass. Now, the thing with these, <laughs> the thing with these is it depends what kind of reader you are because these books are not the same. Okay, Throne of Glass was originally written as a YA fantasy series. There is romance in this book. I'd say there's sprinklings, but it's nowhere near the plot or the point of this book. This series is adult fantasy and it is very heavy on the romance, especially in the later books. Both these series are long and they're labors of love. While Akatar only is like five books right now and one of them is clearly a little novella, most of the books in the series are over 600 pages. Throne of Glass has eight books <laughs> with, like I said, the last five being over six, like 600 pages as well. So it's not only one you're gonna get through quick anyways, these are gonna be labors of love. You're gonna be putting your time and effort into the series. So you need to know which one to start with based on what kind of reader you are. If you're there for the romance, you're going for this one. If you're there for plot and assassins, you're going for this one. And I don't know why I always fear this because it's the same with both these series, but when I always get scared recommending these, I'm always scared, like I just said, because the first book is never the strongest. And that's just like how it always is. Like when I read Throne of Glass, this is like, I think like a 4.25, 4.5. I was like, this is incredible. Like I thought so. But then every book like after it was pretty much a five star. So even though this book was incredible, it wasn't the best in the series. When you got to Akatar, I think when I first rated, like when I first read this book, I rated it like a 3.75 or a four star. It definitely wasn't as high. Um, I already read this and like, what is all this hype about? What is up? Like, why does everybody love this woman? Like this was good, but it wasn't magnificent. But you have to understand that when you have currently 16 books to read, the first one's not gonna be the best, okay babe? It's not bad, but it's not gonna be the best. I feel like a lot of the readers I know who want to get into Sarah J Mass are romance readers. So if you're in that category, you definitely need to start with this. This is where you need to start. After all that, like yapping, this is where you need to go. We're gonna find out what kind of reader you are truthfully when it comes to these two. Because what's gonna happen is this book is gonna be good, but it's not gonna be great. And you're not gonna be obsessed with the series yet until you get to one of these two. And it's gonna happen during one of these. This is the second book, this is the third. If you are a romance reader, you're gonna fall in love after Akamath. This is a book that's very romance heavy. It's when like, we get our romance going. It is incredible. If you are a romance reader, this is when she's gonna click for you. If you are a fantasy reader, this is where it's gonna click for you. Aquawar is the third book. It's definitely like more heavy on politics, I'd say, and kind of just like the lore of what's actually going on in the world itself, not purely the romance. So if you're into, like if you are a fantasy reader, this is my first five star of this series and the first one I ever gave Sarah J Mass. And then pretty much almost every single book I read after this was a five star. <laughs> so my order that I read them in, the one that I recommend you do is Akatar, read those five books all the way through. You're gonna do Throne of Glass, read those all the way through. We'll go through reading order in a second. And then Crescent City all the way through. Obviously, if she becomes with more series or more books come out, these orders might change a little bit, but it's very clear for me right now, Akatar, Throne of Glass, Crescent City. 
for a little bit of what they're about because I feel like a lot of people recommend these books and you actually don't know what you're getting into when you head in. So I said, this is a romantic and this book at its core is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. However, I didn't know that until after I finished it. <laughs> like when I was reading it, I was like, oh, you know, it sounds kind of like a similar, like, and I was like, you, yeah, I shouldn't pick up on that. I was just a little bit slow. But this is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. Pretty much in this book, our main character is Feyre. And at the start of this book, she's with her family, who's her dad and her two sisters. And she's pretty much, it gives Katniss Everdeen vibes, where she's like pretty much trying to provide for her family because they don't really have anything. Um, and so she's out hunting one day in the woods and she sees a wolf. And the skin of the wolf is like very, very, um, it could probably feed them for like a month, I think they said at one point. Is that what the back says? Literally says, the skin of the wolf would bring enough gold to feed her sisters for a month. So she sees this wolf and she's like, done. So she kills the wolf and then it ends up being that it is actually a like magical fey creature. The woods near where she lives kind of connects onto this like fey magical land and one crossed over and she killed it. It's like high fey lord pretty much comes to her house, takes her captive as like a punishment, um, but he ensures her that like her family will be taken care of while she's gone. Remember she was taken like prisoner by this like high fey lord and brought to his land. When I say it like that, I don't know how I didn't know it was Beauty and the Beast retelling at first, but that's where it is. Obviously it becomes so much more than that as you go along. Like that plot very much lasts for this book only. And then the other books, that's out the window as you move on. As you go from here, like I said, it's just, there's so much action, romance, found family. The found family in this series is like unlike anything else besides Maybe Throne of Glass. A lot of people are like, can I just skip the novella? And like, no, you shouldn't. It's a cute little, we call it like the Christmas novella is what this is. And it's like the one book you get in the series where it's like from everybody's point of view, you get like all the different points of views, which I think is kind of fun. And that book is like the turning point in this series where these first three books are all in Feyre's point of view. So it's kind of like her initial trilogy arc. I think originally it's actually only supposed to be a trilogy at first. And then after A Court of Frost Starlet, you go into A Court of Silver Flames and this is Nesta's POV now. So now you're moving into one of Feyre's sister's point of view. Feyre is no longer like our main narrator. So this is actually where like a lot of people said this series fell off them. They didn't like this one as much because they don't relate to Nesta as much. I loved this book and I thought it was like her like pure redemption arc. It was like an easy five star for me. I think this is like my favorite in the series thus far. So this one you're gonna read A Court of Thorns and Roses, A Court of Mist and Fury, then A Court of Rings and Ruin, A Court of Frost and Starlight, and then A Court of Silver Flames. This one, like I said, is still ongoing. So her next release, we're all hoping, is the next Akatar book. It should be. And then you go to her next work and this one actually is a completed series. So you can actually get kind of like a nice rounded off whole feeling at the end, you know? We're gonna go over the reading order and I'm just gonna toss all some people up. Um, this series has a very controversial reading order online. It's very, everybody has their own opinions and that's cool. People either start one of two places. When Sarah J. Mouse wrote the series, okay, she wrote the first two books, Throne of Glass and Crown of Midnight, and then released prequel novellas called The Assassin's Blade. So this book clearly takes place before Throne of Glass. So I'll be with different opinions about whether you should read the prequels first or the first book first and then go back and read the prequels afterwards. I personally, and the queen agrees with herself, Sarah J. Mass said that her reading order is this way. I think you should start with Throne of Glass. This one, like I said, this series becomes so much more, obviously, on the scale of eight books. It becomes something so incredible and beautiful. I can literally cry talking about it because my Roman Empire. But at the core, this book is about Selena. She's an assassin who's been locked up in like the top prison of this land. One day, somebody shows up to her prison, summons her to go to the castle, and she's invited to participate in this like tournament to be the king's royal assassin. If you guys love the kind of fantasy competition tournament thing, you're gonna eat this up. This is fantastic. But what some people say is that they find this book a little bit hard to get into and that they like having the backstory first and they find this easier to read. Also because if you don't know one thing that happens in this book, it gets spoiled for you in this. But also if you know nothing about the series, if you read this in here, you're not gonna know you're gonna read about it in here. Does that make any sense? I can't say without spoiling anything, but pretty much they say that this and the last novella in this hits so much harder if you don't see it coming. But personally, I think when you get to that point and you know what's going to happen then, it hits just as hard. Like for example, my sister-in-law tried reading this and she couldn't really get into this one. And so she picked up this one, loved it, and is now in the third book. So it really depends on what you think you're going to enjoy more. I personally love starting with this book, falling in love with Selena over the first two books and then getting to go back and read about her past. I thought that was so powerful and I loved that. But if you're someone who needs that, like you need the proper order, you need the sequence of events properly, then you can read this first. But I highly, I don't, I don't like that. 
Also because, because this series is so long, I find that sometimes when things happen books and books and books ago, not that you forget about it, but Sarah J Maas is a genius and she layers things in this so well where you will all of a sudden like read something in the you'll read the whole series and then all of a sudden you'll read something back in the first book that you realize foreshadows something that happens at the very end and you're like oh she saw that coming eight books away and that's like one of the main reasons i'm so excited to go back and annotate the series because foreshadowing is like a huge thing that i go for and i look for and so the other thing is this technically is five separate yet yeah, five five separate novellas that all take place beforehand but the thing is all of these characters pop up somewhere in this series they most of them pop up between like air of fire and um empire storms somewhere in there you see them again and i just think that reading this right before air of fire then all these characters are fresh in your head you don't forget any of them then you see them pop up and you're like oh my gosh Whereas if you're in the very, very beginning, it might take you a second. Because what Sarah J Maas does all the time, she starts to describe people just based off like what they look like. Not, they won't say their name right away. Or even like in interactions, she'll be like, oh, I talked to this man who looked like this. And like, you, she doesn't tell you who it is, like you know who it is, that makes sense? So then the other thing you have to look at too is a lot of people talk about, do you read Assassin's Blade after Crown of Midnight, which is book two, or do you read it after Air of Fire, which is the next book? I personally read it after Crown of Midnight. I thought that was definitely the way to go. Because I wish I had air fire here so I could like hold it up. But um, pretty much what happens is the end of this book changes the entire game. And the end of this book changes the trajectory of the series. It's now like a whole new ball game. We're somewhere else. Everything's different happening. It's crazy. So going from that crazy ending of this, I think this is the perfect bridge then before you go into air of fire. Because what's going to happen then is what if you finish this and go into air of fire and you're in that action in that new world and things getting crazy and you're really excited and then you have to take a step back and then go back and read the prequels, you're not going to want to. You're going to keep going forward with the story. So what I did is I just read this, took that ending in, took a pause, read this, and then dove head first into the rest of the story. But so you're going to read it. If you're listening to me, you're going to read it. Throne of Glass, book one. Then you're gonna go into Crown of Midnight as book two, Assassin's Blade as book three. You're gonna read Air of Fire as book four, Queen of Shadows as book five. And this one is like my baby. This one lives rent free in my head all the time. And then you're gonna get to the lovely or dreaded Tandem Raid. Pretty much these two books take place at the exact same time. Just our main characters are kind of split up in different areas and you're following their stories in each of those areas. If you go into this book first, this book is book six technically, and you read this whole book through, this book ends on the craziest ending known to man. So that if you try to go back to this and you're reading those same events take place over the entire time, you're not gonna want it. You're just gonna wanna read this guy because this is where all the good stuff happens next. But also I thought the story was really interesting and incredible. I know a lot of people don't like this or don't rate it as highly. I still really, really enjoyed this, but I do think I would have enjoyed it a lot less if I had to read it independently afterwards. So you're gonna read these together. And how you're gonna do that is you're gonna look up Empire Storms and Tower of Dawn Tandem Read on Google. There's gonna be a lovely little checklist that pops up for you that literally tells you what order to read them in. It'll be like, you're gonna read chapters one through three of here, and then one through two of here, and four to six, and three to five. It's so gonna like, take you through the entire thing to go back and forth between them. And it makes so that these timelines link up like seamlessly. It'll literally be like, something happened in this book, and then the next chapter that you read on your list, people are finding out in this book what happened. So I think it's important to tandem read these. If you're the kind of person where that wouldn't bother you, going through the same story all over again after a massive cliffhanger, then you know what, you go girl, do these separate, but I'm telling you, do them together. And then of course, King of Ash, which is a brick of a book. It's almost, a, it's a thousand pages, I believe, or really close. What is it? 907, oh, 980 pages. So, She's a brick. I actually read this in a day for a challenge. That's a whole other story for another time. But um, this book is probably the best book I've like, read in my entire life. No word of a lie. Um, I think about this book daily. I, there's actually a quote from this book I want tattooed on my body when I finally have the urge to get a tattoo. And I just thought this ending was like so perfect. And like I, I can't think about this book without getting emotional. So we're just not going to do that. But this book is the cherry on top of this entire series. It just makes everything worth it. Everything comes together. She leaves nothing um, unfinished. Every single person along the way, every single thing that's ever happened makes sense in this book. And it is just master mind literature. And then once you get your soul crushed by that, you're gonna hop into Crescent City. These books of hers feel different. I'll to say they don't, like, don't really like them as much, but it's because these are urban fantasy. And what that means is these are books that have all the high fae and all that stuff, but they're written as if it's now. Like these characters have cell phones or are going to the club. 
<laughs> you're like, hold on a second. Like, you know, they're taking dance classes and having jobs and stuff. And that's unheard of in these other books, obviously. So there's a different vibe to this book, but I love it. I would say go into this book without reading a single thing about it. Because like I said, I just read the back now. I didn't read the back when I first started it. But like, I remember how crushed I felt when I first read this. And if you had read this back, you've already had a hint that it was coming. Like not necessarily how it happened, but you would already like understood. Because pretty much you meet all the characters, we love them. And then something absolutely soul crashing happens in the first like 30 pages. And you're like, and that's what fuels this entire series. As I say that, there's also a big element of mystery to this book as well, which I think actually is why I love this book so much. It's like urban fantasy with a lot of mystery. There's all like politics going on here. It's very, very heavy, but interesting. Also to note, you're going to Sarah J Mass book. While I wouldn't say the same for House of Sky and Breath, I truthfully believe every single word of this book is meant to be there. Some people say it's like very long, which it is. It's like almost a like hundred page book. But truthfully, I don't think any information in this book could have been left out. Like I remember every single thing I read, I think added to the story and was important. Um, however, one thing you have to know about Sarah J Mass books is pacing. And not that her pacing is bad. Like I said, this all kind of felt very much one level, maybe like you had like some ups and downs everywhere. But the thing is, when you hit about 200 to 150 pages left, you're like, this book could be done. This, this is finished now. That's a good ending. And then something wild happens. And then the next 150 pages are just absolute action-packed whiplash. Okay? It is literally um, insane. That's really how a lot of Sarah Mass's books are. Like the last 100 pages, be prepared to like break your neck um, with the amount of whiplash you're getting. Then this book is known for having the best cliffhanger known to man. Really jealous if you get to read it now and not before the third book and this came out because I feel like everybody else who had to read this and then wait over a year and a half to get the next book, it was awful. Um, this one I would say I don't think is as strong as the first one as a whole. The ending is what makes Love People rate it really highly. Obviously, we love the ending. But truthfully, like the base of this, I don't think it is quite as strong, but it is still very good. And I don't have House of Flame and Shadow because it's not out in paperback here in Canada and the US. But um, that one then comes next and that's where we start seeing some crossing over happen. And then this is why it's very important to not read Akatar before this because some of the things in, that happen in that third book only make sense if you've read Akatar. Because then like you realize like some things are happening, you're like, oh wait a second, and it's because you know what's happening in that one. Does that make sense? Anyways, friends, I hope that was like a pretty nice crash course in Sarah J. Mass. Um, I love this woman so much. Like I said, I am obsessed with her. She's probably my favorite author of all time, or one of at least. Um, the Hunger Games was my favorite series for over a decade and then Throne of Glass came and overtook it. So that's how you know it means business. If you guys liked today's video and like you like the style of me just like yapping about an author book I really like, please let me know because I would love to make more of these specifically about like series I enjoyed and doing like reviews for them or even just like talking about like authors and kind of the same thing here like reading orders or like what you can expect in their books, all that stuff. Uh, so if you guys enjoyed this, please let me know because I found this really fun to film. As always, if you guys liked today's video, please forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm also on TikTok and Book Corner and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!